Just to say, um, I said a little bit of this just before, but um, yeah, Duran Duran played in Ibiza in the late 80s at the once, where it was called the Ku Club, now Privilege. Um, it was part of a concert series that Pino Sagliocco promoted. The footage of it online is, is unbelievable. And from my own personal point of view, I've tried so many times to bring this band back to Ibiza. Um, and two times were cancelled. Third time was cancelled because of COVID. So I can't actually believe this is happening. Um, and the last, time, the last time I presented this band on a stage was actually when they met Mark Ronson for the first time over 10 years ago in Paris. A very proud moment for me professionally, and it turned into a beautiful relationship. And uh, to have you guys here at IMS means a lot to us. And having here now Errol Alken, who's just produced the new album, this is a very special moment about how this record came together. So um, they're playing again on Sunday night. I've just told you your delegates badge gets you all into the concert. And there's a certain DJ set at Pasha tomorrow night. Um, so enjoy, enjoy this moment. Thank you, Duran Duran. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Hi, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Do, do you remember that night? Thank you. <laughs> well, I just said to Nick, I, I, I think Freddie Mercury sang with Montserrat Caballari that, that night. That's right, was, yeah. And I remember not getting any sleep yeah, yeah. You afterwards. Were, <laughs> did you ever during that? The days. Yeah. I can remember. There was a danger, John, you, you didn't remember it, but your, your picture's on the wall at Pike's Hotel, I'm pretty sure. So you were, you were definitely there. <laughs> <laughs> and so was Freddie Mercury. I, think so. I, I remember the band Poison played and they went on stage, and the person doing the lighting and everything put so much smoke on the stage, all you could see were the tips of their cowboy boots and occasionally the heads of their guitars as they threw them over, like, did that with them. <laughs> it was Insane. Uh, you're here celebrating a four-decade career. Um, well, when you started out, did you ever envisage that you might still be doing this breaking new ground? Definitely not. 40 years later. Well, when we started, the Sex Pistols had lasted for about two years, and the Beatles lasted for maybe eight years. Uh, the Stones were, were going on, obviously, but, but we thought, well, if we get somewhere in between the Sex Pistols and the Beatles, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be terrible. I don't know about Here you, we are. but I never used to look a week ahead at that age. You know, it was like what was happening tomorrow. So to be here, what, 40 years later? Yeah, and, and, yet, incredible. and yet now you don't know what's happening tomorrow, do you? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> no, no. I'm back there again. <laughs> Is there anything left on your kind of bucket list, really, individually, in terms of what you want to do with the band? Oh, I think there's loads. We haven't even played in India, China. Uh, I mean, that's a big chunk of the world. Um, no, oh, I don't know. The, working with different people is amazing. Working with Errol um, on this last album and Giorgio Moroder, that took us four decades. We wanted to work with him from the very, very beginning, and somehow it came together on this album. So that, that, was, that, was, uh, that was a great combination. We're going get, to get into that in a minute. John, any, anything on your bucket list? Of... Oh, man, I mean, it's all so good, you know. And, uh, I mean, even this weekend has turned into a real really super amazing couple of days, you know, that we're, we're all really excited about. And Nick and I have got a little show. About, um, I mean, you know, it's hard to predict. It's hard to know where it's going to go, you know? I think it's all, you know, we've got a bunch of, I mean, it, it doesn't sound all that ambitious, but we've got about four months of shows ahead planned for the summer. And I think if we can get through those four shows and like kill it most nights, you know, that's, that's about as far as I need to think ahead. Roger? <laughs> I don't know, we've done so much. Um, I mean, Giorgio Moroder was a big one because we never got to work with Giorgio in the, the early days. And uh, I know that the feeling was mutual and we finally got to work with him on this record. So that was a huge bucket list moment. They sometimes say never work with your heroes some, sometimes. Or never they do, yeah, but I've got to say Giorgio it, was incredible. I mean, okay. he's just, he has not lost anything. It, it was so productive working with him. And it's so much part of our DNA, what Giorgio does. So it was just, it was incredible. It was an incredible moment working with him. So that's okay. a big one that we've just ticked off. Big, a big a big tick. Simon, you were, we're trying to rest your voice for tomorrow, but... <laughs> I, got, I, got a, I got a thing I'd like to do. 
<clears throat> I'd like to go on tour with the band and have a tent that travels with us where we put on new independent artists, bands, new, showcase them. Mm. I'm all for that. Whoosh tent would be amazing. great. The whoosh tent. Yes. I don't know if every, everyone knows, but um, you've always had a kind of strong connection with the club scene in, in the sense that the band started pretty much out of a club in, in Birmingham. Tell, tell us about those times and how you all came together. It was the Run Rummer, right? Well, John and I um, were looking for somewhere to play with the band in its current lineup in, I guess, what, 1979 or something. And the coolest club in Birmingham at that time was called the Rum Runner. So we went there uh, with a little cassette tape to meet with them, hoping we'd get a gig. Um, and they sat down, the, the Barrow brothers sat down and talked to us. And Paul was a little more interested and said, well, wait a minute, um, I, I've got some other ideas. And they ended up managing us for the first five years. Um, and so I guess, I guess it was a meeting worthwhile. Definitely. I mean, yeah. it was an interesting time in music because you had the punk revolution, which, which really was the energy. I mean, none of us would be sitting here if that hadn't happened. And that gave us the fuel, really, to think that we could be musicians. But then that post-punk thing started to happen, and you started looking at music, listening to music. Giorgio Moroder, for instance, we, we often talk about new wave and punk. What's the difference? You know, what defines new wave? And we usually come back to new wave, you had to dance to it. You know, so, so, so the rhythm section became significant. And there was a lot of interesting strands going on post-punk that, um, that we were listening to. And that sort of got us into the club music. And then the fact that we then ended up spending about two years there most nights, you know, where we were working there, rehearsing there. I mean, that just became part of, of the Duran Duran DNA. Nick got the best job. He was the DJ. Some yeah, magic. So Couldn't do it now, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Too complicated for me now. I used to use vinyl. I think somehow it was just the concoction of your, your synths and the rhythm section that just had something. It's, it's funny that, I, I mean, talking to Errol about it as well, but you... Um, so many people want to work with you because of what, what you represented. I know Mark Ronson said the same thing, Nile Rogers said the same thing. Um, how did you come to, f you, you've always had this thing about digging deep and f finding producers. Do you, do you, yeah. I mean, you could almost produce yourself, so what, what, what drives that? <laughs> well, actually, you know, we always like having someone else in the room. If anyone in the band can produce something, but, but having someone leading the way when you've got four maniacs in there already is always a good idea, I think. Um, I mean, Errol's very brave. Uh, I, I think he's he, very brave, actually, he, to work he, with He that. got into the room, I think he thought, oh, we'll get this done in a couple of weeks, and sort of, well, 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 six months later, nine months later, and he was still fighting away, but he's very, very resilient. We usually, we can finish them off quite quickly. You know? <laughs> Chew them up and spit them out. Errol, how, how, how's it been, this experience for you? Yeah, it's been, um, I think, when I came into it, uh, you know, I've got, I had this kind of feeling that we could do something quite spontaneous and fast and, you know, because... And you were wrong. And I was... <laughs> it took, took two years. It, I, I was kind of... Wrong with I, was, I, was, I mean, were you intimidated by the, by the notion of it? We, um, not really. Not intimidated. I, I think I was more kind of... Um, I mean, I've been asked before if, if it's like intimidating to go into, you know, work with people that you, you know, whose records you love and, you know, you kind of, in, in your mind, you may be thinking, you know... Are you kind of competing with something, you know, which is almost like impossible to compete with because it's not just, it's not just the music that, you know, that, that makes up all the components in your mind of something that you are, you know, in love with as such. Um, but I just, I mean, my feeling towards it is that let, let's just go in and make something that we love, you know, that, you know, I've got full faith in, in all, of the, all of the elements that make up the band. It's just about making each one sound and feel as great as it can, you know, in that moment. So, you know, it's, it, it, you, you, you've got to go in with this kind of, like, absolute um, blind, like, enthusiasm and belief, you know. And like Errol's a very like, spontaneous guy. He really is. Um, he, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd hear something in the music or in one of our, you know, parts that any one of us laid down. And he'd chase it and he'd follow it and it could change the entire song. 
Um, and do, it, do you have a set way? Of, what is the creative process between the four of you? Are there are there ground rules? Do you walk in with one songs? Rule, in the, well, nobody comes in with any having done any homework. Really? Well, yeah. 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 We're yeah. just too lazy for that. Yeah, well, it's, I it's think chaos. Errol, it's chaos, really. We, we rely yeah. upon chaos and hoping we can organise it somehow and that some fabulous accidents happen along the way. Um, with this, it was interesting we're having Errol in the room because, you know, we, we have a bit of an energy crisis at the moment. I tell you, if they could just plug into Errol, <laughs> we'd be fine. We could actually... Yeah. Uh, we could certainly funny, deal with Nick, the UK problem. You talk about chaos, and I think in the chaos, there's something that's like a... Like a, a where, which um, it's like a little twist of, of some, some kind of gravity that all the good stuff starts to come to. 100%. Yeah. And, and, we, and we've got the ears to be able to hear that. And that's what, how a song starts. And, and because none of us go in with any preconceived ideas, you're able to really hear the best of those ideas. Um, and that's a very important part of it. I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, um, the thing that surprised me most about Errol, you know, and we've worked with all kinds of producers over the, over the years, and, you know, the more, shall we say, the more electronically oriented the producer, probably the less need for me to even be in the studio, you know, or, because they, they come with, you know, their own sounds, and, and I kind of expected to have that experience with Errol, and really, I think, first, second day at the studio, it became really apparent to me that this was going to be a very bespoke situation. And the time that Errol took to get the bass sound, the snare sound, the keyboard sound, the vocal sound, I mean, we hadn't, we hadn't had that. I felt that I hadn't had that attention to detail in years. I mean, when we were working with Timberland, I mean, Timberland was like, he was the man of the hour when we worked with him. It took three days before he said to me, oh, I see what you do. <laughs> you know, so now, you know, when you've got, like, Errol just did this extraordinary, you know, and the thing is, when you've got somebody that is really taking that much care about the sound of your instrument and how you're going to play it, then that is inspiring. He's not dialing it in. Just to interject, I've been to Errol's house, and I see Pride Position is the, um, it's the Reflex 12-inch, yeah. right? He loves your bass. He loves the way you play. Absolutely. I mean, an another thing just to, just to add to that is when you're going into something like this and we were saying about being intimidated or not, I think you should go into it w w with the feeling that you're going to make the best sounding record that that band's ever going to make because you've got that opportunity. You know, you've got the history of whatever's come before. You've got the potential of what's going to come in the future. You should just focus on what you're going to do now. And if you don't, if you're going with anything less than that, then you shouldn't be there. I'm still quite curious if you're all not seeing each other all the time, get back in the room for the first time, and then, like, what are we going to play now? <laughs> Does someone go, let's do one like Rio? <laughs> or, let's do no. one. Well, or Errol plays you some usually, records. <laughs> usually we start off with a tempo. Right, OK. Yeah. That's the thing that's kind of great about us still working together, though, is, is that we all know how adaptable everybody is. And somebody finds a seed, something, it could come from any one of us. It could come from Errol, maybe you'd say, oh, he's a rhythm and just run something for a minute and then it's disappeared. And, and you start playing to it and you don't know what direction it's going in. That's what's exciting about music to me. If we're making the same thing time and time again, it gets a bit dull. But actually, there's things on this record that it's taken us 40 years to get to, songs like More Joy. We've never done anything quite like that. And, and that, that happened through this process of just searching for some magic. Yeah. And the other secret source on, on this record was Graham Coxon. I was just going to bring yeah. him and, up, yeah. You know, I mean, and, you know, he ended up working with us really because Nick met him, they got along, and Nick asked him to play. Then Errol, it was Errol's first idea, was like, how do you feel about playing with Graham Coxon? And really, having Errol in the room with us, sorry, having Graham in the room with us was so inspiring. Mm. And so much of what he played, because the four of us, I mean, we're very much in tune. You know, we have this very similar reference points. We like the same kinds of things. We're always looking to do, you know, there's certain things that we're all going after. So, it, as Nick says, it's very important to have somebody in the room that's like a, a rogue element, you know. And, and Graham was just like, I mean, he'd start playing and we'd all be like, ooh, wow, that's good, let's follow him. Yeah. You know, like, 
Yeah. He, he was really... And we've not, ha- we've, we've not actually had a guitar player in the room with us for a long time. I was going to say, you were intimidated the by his virtuosity. Process. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and we, we had, John, thing, we I, had I John Frusciante on the, the last record, right. but that was very much something that was kind of flown in afterwards. So to have somebody that played like that in the room was... Uh, Mm. Was a re- 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 I heard you say, Simon, say. on the Rock and Tours podcast that he he never wants to play the same thing twice. Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. No, he's he's got um, he one. There's two things. One, he never wants to play the same thing twice. Two, he never wants to play anything that anybody else has ever played before, mm. which makes him just his search for just for for new ground. His kind of experimental attitude is such a powerful force in the writing room. Mm. Okay. Um, Rio, 40 years old, um, incredible achievement, and, and, and coinciding obviously with your 40th anniversary. Anything you would have gone back and done differently with that record now? Or? It's a perfect record. <laughs> it's perfect. Pretty good. And I mean, you, 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 you've got to make a few imperfect ones to be able to look back and go, no, that one's perfect. I mean, for me, I wouldn't change anything about it. No, absolutely. And what's your, um, what are you hoping for now, um, touring-wise this year, in terms of the way the show's going to roll? That we on? get through it all and the shows are great. Right, yeah. um, that? <laughs> that we get through it all and the shows are great. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult for artists now. Um, uh, I think trying to deal with the pandemic or whatever it has become now, it's fine saying it's not there. We all know it's still out there. And um, trying to play a show, trying to put on events like this, all those things have been so hard. But we're determined to do them because we want to be out there playing and we know hopefully some of you would like to come along. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very, very complex now with all the policies you've got to have. And uh, so I just hope that we don't have to stop at any point. Really a show at a time, isn't it? You know, yeah. we've, we've got a lot booked, but really it's day by day, isn't it? So uh, let's hope we... we're finally coming out of this thing and they will, they will all happen. All right. Well, it's, been am- it's amazing to have you back on Ibiza, and why th- this Ibiza weekend for you. Tell us a little bit about it, because it's not just, you're here at the IMS, but it, there is actually a Duran Duran weekend going on. Well, there is tonight, well, tomorrow even, um, there is the opening of an exhibition at Hangar 89. Is that right? Hangar, You've, Hangar anybody something know? a lot of numbers after it, for sure. <laughs> exactly. And, and that, is, something that, is, that is a visual... Um, artworks by Nick and by John. I'm going to go and have a sneak preview this evening. Are you now? Mm, and of course, sneaky. Errol is DJing tonight at upstairs. 10 o'clock, I believe. It's 10 o'clock upstairs. Uh, here in Destino. And then um, tomorrow night at Pacha, um, Roger Taylor is, is the DJ from 9 p.m. until 11.30, I believe. Let's talk to a little bit about that, Roger, because you left, you left the band at one point and then went and kind of dived into that. Yeah, I went, I went missing for you a few went. years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick said I went out for it to get a pack of cigarettes and so never came back for 15 years. So. You found him down the back of the sofa. <laughs> exactly. And got into DJ. I did, yeah, yeah. Well, I was making... Uh, Dance music for a while in the 90s. Uh, I used to release on a, a label called Cleveland City Records. I remember it, yeah. Which was uh, based in the Midlands. So I was kind of uh, dabbling with that. And uh, after a while, I got the call from John actually, said, Do you, do you fancy getting the original band back together? And uh, I said, I'll call you back in 12 hours, I think it was. And I, I thought about it and I came back. But the incredible thing that I was in the band originally for, for six years, I left for like 14 years, and I've been back for 20. <laughs> so it's like, it just shows you the longevity. It's difficult to get out once you're in. Yeah, like, yeah, it's like a bit like the foreign like legion. A cult. It's like the foreign legion, once you, you're in, you can't you get out. It would have, you, know? you thought it would have ended by now, and it was still there when you came back. Have you ever yeah, played yeah. Pasha before? Have you ever? I have actually, but in one of the smaller rooms, I've played in the, uh, the funkier room a few years ago, but never in the main room so it's quite a moment pressure mate it's actually a brand new club now no and nobody it's actually opens tonight and they, they actually had it ready um last year but obviously it didn't didn't open so it's kind of new layout um oh is it oh, okay I think you're gonna yeah. be impressed with it yeah the major yeah. major dj booth 
Yeah. Well, is the other one still open? I remember the first time I came here, I was on a holiday, and I went to Pasha, and I went to the Ku Club, and I went to another one called Amnesia. Is that still there? Well, Nick was here in 19... <laughs> Couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. 80? What year was that, Nick? What? 1898. What 81. 1898. <laughs> One of the reasons Simon's lost his voice is because he's been to them all <laughs> for, for, for years. <laughs> We've been to them all, Simon, for years, haven't we? Exactly. What is it about this island, Simon, that keeps you coming back? Oh, this, it's got so much about it. Um, not, just, not just the club scene, the music scene, um, although that's a very important part of it. I mean, it, it does... There's, there's a, there are some places in the world that have a very special musical culture. I'm thinking about, you know, there's that little island in off Senegal, off, um, on, that um, Yusuna Dua comes from. There's lots of drummers there. Um, there's places in Brazil. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and Ibiza's just got a very special musical vibe to it. And, and, it, and because we're involved in that, it always, people, you know, it, we kind of get a little bit of respect here. It's nice. But also, it's, it's a beautiful island in the blue Mediterranean Sea. It's not too far for us to travel, if you're coming from London. Um, there's a lot to it. Would you ever make an album here one day, you think? <laughs> you I get me right. might do it, but I don't know if, if, if everybody else would be into that. John wants know. to chip in there. No, I was just, actually, I just had a memory as you were talking about the music of Ibiza, and when we did get the band back together, which was like, what, about 12, 14 years ago, something like that? No, maybe more than that. No, How long ago was it? 20, 20, 20 years ago. When, when we got back together to do the project that became Astronaut. Yes, that's yeah. about 20 years. 20. And, and we were talking, and Roger and I were, you know, we hadn't played together for like 16 years, as, as Roger said, and we're thinking, well, who are we? You know, we kind of completely lost our sense of, you know, what we were as a rhythm section. And I remember we started listening to all those Kiss um, compilation albums from Ibiza mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and thinking, listen to this, listen to this. This is kind of where we're coming from, and it's now. You know, so the Ibiza music, the rhythm sections particularly, were really important at that time for us to sort of find our way back, you know, to... We were going to that club, yeah. weren't we, in Saint-Tropez, which is called... Cap de Roy. Cap de Roy, exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. The, the Voix Rouge, um, the one on the beach, yeah. Yeah. I, I, they were the yeah. days. I remember the other seminal moment, I think me and you, Simon, I, I, I don't know, it's 15, 20 years ago, whatever, we were in Formentera having lunch, and you said, yeah. I've just got to puff off and do something. And you actually flew to New York and with the boy, with the guys, right. and got the uh, MTV, the, the the kind of legendary award, yeah, achieve. lifetime achievement award. <clears throat> yeah, we've and been I collecting those for about twenty-five yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We haven't, by the way, we haven't, an, we haven't got an we haven't got an MBE yet, though. No, by the way, no, you haven't got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a word. Um, <laughs> I hear rumours actually that you might be in, inducted into the, the Hall of Fame. Well, we've been nominated. Been nominated, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, we're going to find we're going to find out on Wednesday. It's a shame he couldn't find out here. <laughs> Be an extra celebration for Sunday night. <clears throat> you never know. It's, it's mad. Um, let's go back to the uh, the album, Errol. Um, you you've been what's you starting to remix some of the tracks, bring them to bring them into Clubland. I believe one is coming out today, or that just went. Yeah, out. yeah. I kind of. Um, <clears throat> Um, when we were in the studio uh, making the record, we'd always, like, in, in between moments of recording and when we're just kind of, you know, diving into the songs and seeing what's in there, um, I do a lot of kind of improvised remixing, you know, in the moment, just to kind of, just to hear how things interlocked and to kind of explore some of the parts and, and stuff like that. And, you know, for me, you know, Duran Duran's music, um, especially the night versions, you know, 12 inch extended versions, uh, have always been a massive inspiration to me. You know, even from when I first started DJing in dance clubs, making that move from alternative clubs into dance clubs, I kind of bought some of those records with me because they embodied the spirit of where I was coming from in Clubland. Um, so it was really important to make sure that that element was there. You know, even in the, you know, single versions or the album versions, you know, if you kind of like 
go on, you know, excavate down the layers. You know, the, the drums are danceable, the bass line is danceable. You know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the you know the synth parts are uh, exotic and inspiring and alien and all, and, and the guitar parts as well. You know, all those things are there, and then you know you, you, you kind of you know break it all down and then see how that works with vocal elements. So everything has been designed to be deconstructed and then reconstructed as such. So, yeah, I've been kind of delving into that a little If you start working through the songs, there'll be the remix album. Um, well, <laughs> I hope so. Well, you know, what was interesting for all of us in the band is that um, when, when we worked with Errol, we, we very much liked some of the remixes done, some of the dance stuff. And then we made this album. We said, well, you're going to do some remixes. He said, yeah, 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 definitely at some point. But actually, he delivered the first one for the song, All of You, uh, just last week. And we all wrote it's back when we heard it, and we all said, wow, this is the best remix we've had in years. And it made me realize how terrible most remixes are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really so bad. And, 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 and Eros is fantastic. We all absolutely love it. it it's everything that I think the Duran Duran sound should be for the dance floor now. Is everybody ready for a Pete Tong remix of Duran Duran? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't one. usually do remixes. I started one, but, but I never finished it. <laughs> what, he's really set a high bar now, though, wasn't he? You didn't really? say I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to them, but yeah. you do play it, though, occasionally. The pa Paper Gods. Pete, yeah. Pete did a Paper Gods remix, yeah. actually. But I think the Tovlo tune, I'll have a go at that one. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I've make got a note, a, I, make I a note of that. We should get a few. I've got one other question. There's so much we could chat about here, but um, I've got to ask you about the secret source of what keeps you guys together after all this time. Because you know, I know, I know, people leave and come back, but um, what is it? What is? Well, what's the magic? You know, it's our friendship primarily. You know, we're mates that happen to make a lot of music over the years, and we've got this incredible brand partnership thing that just keeps going but i think it's our friendship really um and you know and friend and friendships over time have to really they have to take on a lot of different shapes right to so stay in friends with somebody a lot of respect you've got to really yeah, yeah i don't know we've we've just grown up together we've all gone and made music with other people it's almost like a brotherhood i think yeah at this point. and we all kind of come back and go this is, it's always interesting when we get together. The music's always interesting. I think and our flexibility is also really important to us because there's not many other bands or any that I can think of particularly who have the ability or the flexibility to do what we can do. Because when we're going to make an album, you know, we can make a completely electronic record if we want, or we can make a very live-sounding rock record, or as with this record, we can blend the, the, the live performance of bass, drums, and guitar with the electronics. And, and I think yeah, that, that's enabled us to keep moving with modern music and try to push it a little bit along the way. Okay, um, you know, we, 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 we have friendship, we have music, a passion for music that we share. But there's one other thing I think is very important. It's quite prosaic in a way, um, but the fact is we split all of the income equally. So nobody earns any more than anybody else. And, and any band who's, who's listening or watching, I would suggest that that's a very good way to proceed if you want to be in a band that is together after 40 years. And it's totally uh, democratic as well. That's the, one of the big things, that every decision has to run through the, the whole band. You know, you don't have one person that makes any decision on their own, I, you know, I think, it has to go you know, you're probably us. way past having to kind of make an album. So what, who calls who and, and decides <laughs> it's time? <laughs> is there a catalyst? Um, a feeling, isn't it? I it's think like, we know. Yeah. We I mean, it's almost like you're busier than... You, you're, look, I'm the laziest guy in the band. Right. Yeah. I'm the guy who likes taking the longest holidays and going off on trips into the sea and, and the ocean. But there comes a point when I start thinking they're going to be getting itchy now. In fact, I think I'm getting a bit itchy, tired, and so, and, and I think we'd be probably all around the same sort of time. We come back and we, 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 we just feel it's the right time to start again. At the end of the, the song making process, you're, you're the one that has, would, would tend to do all the lyrics or most of the lyrics most of the time. 
A lot. Are they hanging around for you sometimes? What, ha what happens there? <laughs> the guys, no, they Because help. that's the quite a, you know, you're in the room together with, with nothing pre-prepared. Well, I mean, that I almost only, puts the I mean, most... It's happened in different ways. Sometimes I've been deserted and left to do them on my own. But more recently, and particularly with this project, Future Past, I've had support from everyone in the band, plus Errol, on, on the lyrical front. Um, more Joy, we wrote in a, in a really interesting way, in a kind of random way. Um, Nick had Nick and John had a lot to do with that. Um, we, you know, I I think they all realise that it is a quite a task to 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 write the lyrics for a whole album, and and you and and they can't just pretend it's just my job. You know. Well, I think the thing is also. I'll Have you ever cheated, Simon? Like you've written a song, put it mm. in your back pocket, and you're there for like three or four days, and then I, you I pull it out. Ideas, actually... I do have. I do. I've got a little. I've got a little kind of file on my phone, um, and it just has phrases and titles. And I All sometimes work and no play. Makes, <laughs> it makes yeah. But I mean, that's how. But that's how songs like "Union of the Snake," um, "Hungry Like the Wolf," that, that, that they they started off as just phrases that I'd written down. Um, that it it's. Well, inevitably, I think it gets much more complicated when you've written over 200 songs. Um, Simon's used up a lot of ideas. And I wouldn't be able to remember the lyrics. Well, <laughs> I'm really good at recycling. <laughs> and goodness. If you keep going long enough, you can actually Coming start Coming soon, the, the union of the lizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had, <laughs> so I've had, um, I've had writer's block in the past. And I remember something that Michael Hutchins told me years ago when we were both kind of going through it at the same time. He says, well, what I do is I just write the crap that comes out of just any old crap, but I keep writing and I keep writing and I keep writing and eventually it starts getting good. And it does. I, I've done that and it works. Just get rid of the crap first. Yeah, yeah. Or do you just convince yourself? It's called mining. That, look, it's. I've been doing this for three days. It's got to be good by now. Right, that's good. Um, have you got the set worked out for Sunday night? Yep. You have. I think so. Okay. I think we got time. I'll, I'll just put you on the spot for one thing at the end. Um, Errol, favorite Duran Duran song. Favorite Duran Duran song. <laughs> um. I, reflex. If I, I mean, okay. So the first twelve-inch single I bought was the was the Reflex, and um, I think it's a in, incredibly odd but incredible pop record. Like it's like nothing else. Even now, I listen to it, and it just doesn't like. There's, you know, it's so unconventional, very imaginative. Um, there's so much mystery in there. <laughs> You know, keep going, keep going. <laughs> I'm going, don't worry. I'm he's, he's doing the next album. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you know, it's, it, it still blows my mind that that's like a, like a massive number one record, you know. It's, it it shouldn't make sense, but it does. It's one fucked up lyric, isn't it? It's, I, I mean, the thing is, again, it's, you know, the more you kind of think about it, try to understand it, the, more, the less sense it makes, you know, which is brilliant. It's just so much in there that's... Uh, you know, I, I just think it's really brave as yeah. a, as a. I mean, obviously, and I know how it was made, of course. You know, then obviously Niles' input and just all those things, and and the sound of it as well. It, it's you know, it just I can just hear, I could just hear like machines being pushed to the limit as well. You know, um, I think it's a great, a great, great record. Simon, is there a song you sing still on, on every show? You think I can't quite believe we wrote this, <laughs> or I wrote this. <laughs> Oh, um, I was part of writing this. <laughs> yeah, I watched. I think I've watched there, the there are, <laughs> there, there are, you know, I've got, I've got a, a little thing that I say to myself and sometimes to the other guys in the band before we go on stage, and that is, let the songs do the work. We don't have to give a performance. We have to serve the songs. And if you, because you think about the amount of effort you put in, in the studio and in the writing room into making these really great pieces of music. Um, and, and what I find in terms of performance is if I think about the song and giving a good vocal performance, that everything else about my, my, um, my being on stage just falls into place. Um, it's very hard to pick any one song. You know, there's some song, I mean, in a funny sort of way, you know, 
ordinary world means a lot to people. It's a very, it's, it's a, it's a very healing song. It's a song that brings people together, that sh tells people that they're not alone in this world, in how they feel. But I mean, why? You know, it's it's no more important than "Hungry Like the Wolf." You, you know, that also does something too. It's hard. So I, I've got a special relationship with every single one of them. Okay, Roger, have you got a, a favourite or? Um, a well, actually, "Ordering World" came came to my mind there. Uh, although I, I wasn't actually in the band when that was written. Um, I think it's a, it an extraordinary song, uh, lyrically, musically, and I love to play that song. But also Wild Boys because it's so it's so drum centric, isn't it? The, yeah. the drums are so important to that song, and uh, the drum part was actually written by Noel Rogers on a piano. He kind of came up with the tom part for the chorus on a grand piano, so it's a very musical uh, drum part. So uh, that's probably why. Exactly, on the course. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. John, dun, dun. have you got um, Eat Your well, Children? Uh, <laughs> you know, Pick for me, the, like the really busy early songs, like Girls on Film and Rio, you know, and they're like, they usually come towards the end of the, sh end of the set. And, uh, you know, if it's, been a, if it's been a long show, I'm like, oh, man, you know, I've got to get... <laughs> i really got to get my fingers working I'm now. And, and Roger and I sort of look at each other and go, OK, see you at the end of this one. And occasionally we'll say... We'll say, you can't we? Uh, we say, can't we relax the tempos a little bit on these, <laughs> on these songs? But, but you know, you just can't, can you? You can't because that's the vibe, that's the buzz, you know. Yeah, they're and, so and I think fast. It's just some like of songs. it's it's part of it. I mean, I would almost say that's what keeps me young is making those fucking tempos on those songs every time we play them, you know, because they're young men's young men's baselines. You know, and they have to be played just so. I'm all for a young man's bass line. <laughs> <laughs> I heard. <laughs> what, um, have you got, you, you're, you're the uh, last one. I, I, I would pick all, uh, Ordinary all right. World, by the way. No, or, I or mean, Rio. Planet Earth, because it was the first one. I, I, think, I think that's where it started. We didn't know where it was gonna lead, of course. Ooh, but that day, we all went to Top of the Pops together to do Planet Earth. It was a strange thing because we'd grown up as kids looking at David Bowie and Roxy Music and Sparks and Cockney Rebel and then the punk explosion happened and suddenly we were in that room and the Who were on stage yeah. over there. It, it, it was surreal but we, we at that time didn't know if that would be the only time we'd ever be in that room. So that song sort of means a lot. Well fortunately they had you back <laughs> quite a few times yeah. after that. You outlasted the TV show. Um, any, any, have we got time, Ben, for a few questions from the audience? Hello, my name's Nita. And, Hello, uh, nice Hi, to Lisa. Meet you. Nita, N-I-T-A. And um, I had a question. Um, for me, growing up in the 80s, it wasn't just about the music, it was the iconic videos. And I was just wondering if you had a favourite. Video. I have mine. Um, <laughs> I love the White Lines video. Mm. That would be my favourite. Yeah, uh, I, I like the chauffeur actually, the one that we're not in. <laughs> okay, I think that period of when getting to shoot Rio and stuff like that in you know where, where was it you went to do it? Antigua. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we've gone there on a vacation. We've gone there on raise the bar. <laughs> we've gone there on a vacation. You know, yeah. I mean, the f four of us actually, the four of us that are here, went on vacation together to Antigua and we all had huts on the beach and then we we're about to leave the day before we we're about to leave we get a call saying don't go we're coming out with a film crew and Andy's coming and we're going to do a couple of videos it's the way to work isn't it absolutely yeah but you know that boat the the Eileen the well, boat that we filmed it on is apparently currently in Venice at the Biennale okay. oh, wow. yeah. quick one here uh, hi, I'm Fabiana from Argentina. Uh, Hello, press. Fabiana. How are you? Press from, for Lugar con Parlantes. Nice to see you all. Uh, I would like to ask Errol, what, what was your biggest challenge working with them all? Because I know them all. Trying to get the drummer working. Yeah. Probably. The <laughs> and um, how, how did you, I don't know, when you ever, when you find any difficulties, how did you, you know, when they work together, how did you manage working with them? Um, I mean, there wasn't any kind of challenge 
because it's a it's a process in that you know like at every point you know you you get everyone in a room together you make everyone sound as good as they you know as as, as you can do at that point and then you you see what happens and you wait for these as, as Nick said earlier like these kind of beautiful almost like accidents to start happening where you can find like a nucleus to work out from as such so um I mean, I never really, I don't really see things as challenges in studios, or in you know, in the creative process. It's, it's it's just really all about just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, and you know, or, or recognizing something that is a, a, a as a kind of like conventional challenge or difficulty or problem or anything, because even those things are like a little bit of an arc. You know, the other side of it is something incredible. You know, when you get over it. So sometimes you need moments like that. Sometimes, like dropping a microphone, to get a laugh. You know, so you know, sort of. Um, you know, it, it, these things are just sort of. They're just all part of something. You know. You know something that occurred to me about it, Errol, is that um, I always think everything's about the editing in the end, meaning what we all choose for our parts, exactly. what the lyrics are. But more than anything, when you get to the final bit, the mix is the volumes of each part and what you put in and what you put out. And I remember one of my favorite parts of the album process with Errol, because we were both fanatical about the mixes, is we, was, we were sitting there listening to something, and it was the intro of a song. And Errol said, I, I'm just not sure about that one note being there. I said, thank God you said that, because actually it's been driving me mad all day. And we took it out and we both said, ah, now it works. It's that stuff, it's what you take out as much as what you leave in. 100%. And, and, and Errol's got great taste, so that really helped with this album, shining it and putting the, the thin brushes on it and getting everything to be the right, the right way round. Because without a doubt for me, the rhythm section on this is, is the best it's sounded for years. And for sure, that, that was you. a lot of Errol's input. Thank you. Another thing, I mean, goes back to what Simon was saying earlier as well about, you know, like the, the writing process and carrying on, starting from somewhere and carrying on, um, is, you know, my feeling on it, on it has always been, you know, it doesn't, you know, you, you're going to write whatever you're going to write in that moment. It's how you edit it, like Nick said, it's what you leave at the very end, how you frame it, how you present it. That's what's going to be experienced by everybody else, you know. So I say to anybody, you know, any writers, who feel that, that they have a block or they can't get out what they want to get out or anything like that. It's just, just to keep, keep going because really it's, you're going to know when you land upon something that you love or that you recognise as being yours, you know. And it doesn't matter if you write a shit song today and a shit song tomorrow or you make something you don't like the day after. Just keep, keep going, you know. You will make something that you recognise as yours. Errol, you know? could I ask, because you, you, you make quite a lot of music, by yourself, right, where you're programming all the parts. Mm -hmm. So it's one mind is going into the bass line, is going into the drum pattern, is going into the keyboard pattern. When, with, with, with us, you've got four guys in, in very different directions, mm -hmm. right? And yes, we're all, on, we're all sort of playing the same note, kind of, and we're kind of playing the same tempo, sort of, but essentially you're trying to bring us into line with each other without losing the spiky thing that makes it not programmed music, yeah. right? Because I think that's the interesting thing that we find, we find ourselves after all these years being almost an anomaly in that we are this democratically, you know, creative thing that is for, for musicians and whoever's the guests. And we're all making, we're all coming at it from different angles. You know, and your job has never been harder in a way because, because the, most of the music people are listening to is very produced music where it's been, you know, created with, with where the parts are very, you know. Did you, you know, how do you think that? Do you know what well, you have I, I to do. say on that subject? Yeah, I do, but that's the thing that kind of makes it interesting for me as well because it, it you know, goes to that thing when, when all these kind of parts come into phase in some way, you know, then they come in and then they create something unique in that moment, you know, and that's the one thing that I think when we were making this record, that's how it all, you know, when we went back and we listened to what was jammed or, or made, you know, we'd recognise something that sounded interesting and also had that sense of mystery to it, which is, I think, what gives music its longevity as well, is, you know, it, it is, you know, like, you know, the, the, one of the things of working on my own, doing things, is sometimes... It's liberating in one sense, but it's also, it can be quite, you know, you, 
you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm waiting for a happy accident to happen as well, to take me off my own course, you know? So that's why you need to kind of experiment a little bit. But I, what I tend to do is try to finish things in my head as much as I can do, and then go in and, and, and make it. Mm. I think we've thrown away far more music than we've actually put out over our time because we've known it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other artists, who I won't name, who put out lots and lots and lots of records and just keep going, and it doesn't matter what it is, let's get it out. Uh, that's never been our policy at all. Well, listen, it's great that you're pushing the boundaries. It's hugely exciting that you're still seeking out to work with people like Errol. Uh, we are very proud at IMS that you're here in Ibiza for the start of an amazing weekend. Um, you're still killing it with the art. You're still pushing the boundaries with the music. Um, the momentum around the band's incredible. So congratulations and thanks for being here. Thanks, Thank Pete. you, Pete. Thank Thank you. I'm looking forward to your Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.